Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today is Missions Sunday. And if you had attended our services this morning, you would have heard from three different speakers from some of the local missions that we partner with. But just for right now, in your own head, right, at home, what do you think of when you think of the word missionary? Probably someone who is sent on a mission, right? Now, let me ask you another question. Based on that definition, how many of you believe that you are missionaries? I mean, if we're honest, probably not many of us, right? We don't think of ourselves as a missionary. That's not how you would introduce yourself at a party because we tend to think of the word missionary as reserved for like what the people that we heard this morning, right? People who belong to a mission organization, people who usually get to go to some remote part of the world and there they help, right? Or they share the good news of Jesus. But here at Walden Church, one of our core beliefs is that every member is a minister. And when we study our Bible this morning, we're gonna see that every one of us is also called to be a missionary. This morning, we're gonna look at Psalm chapter 67, which is a great Psalm, provides us with some practical guidance about what it means to be a missionary. But even before I read it, I just want you to look at it. So if you turn to your Bibles, open up, look at Psalm 67. I want you to just stare at the text for me, okay? Because originally we understand that this is something that was written in Hebrew, right? Written in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, this psalm consists of exactly 49 words. And it breaks down like this. Verse 1 has seven words. Verse 2 has six words. Verse 3 has six words. Verse 4 has 11 words. Verse 5 has six words. Verse 6 has six words. And verse 7 has seven words. Seven, six, six. 11 is the middle, 667. Six, so that is a literary pattern that points to the, the, the reader to the most important sentence in the entire passage. All the verses point to it, and then all the verses point away from it. Plus, just the number 49, that is also important. Many Jews associate the number 49 with the 49 days between Passover and the Feast of Weeks, which you and I know as Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Jews traditionally sing this psalm in connection with their feast because it's the feast that records the events that are also uh, taking place in Acts chapter 2. So it kind of has a little bit of a, a crossover, a little bit of a foreshadowing. The Bible records that the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 comes on everybody who's gathered in the upper room. And those men and women are then enabled to share the gospel with all the various people groups that are in the city that day. And just with that in mind, just thinking about the beginning of the early church, speaking in tongues, what happened there in Acts 2, let's read Psalm 67, something written a long time before that moment. It says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So the poetic structure of this passage is called a chiasm. In this form, verses 1 and 7 contain very parallel thoughts. Verses 2 and 6 also contain very parallel thoughts. Verses 3 and 5 are exactly the same, right? And the purpose of each one of these structures is to emphasize the middle verse, which is verse 4. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. So that's God's ultimate desire for all of us, that we would be glad, that we would sing for joy, 
and that we, we would experience his rule in our lives. God's rule is just. It provides us with the guidance that we need to live here on this earth. And the rest of the psalm lays out God's plan for how that's all going to get accomplished. In effect, this is his plan for missions, and that is blessing his people. God's big plan for missions is blessing his people. The psalm begins with a prayer, and that prayer is to bless all people. And it ends with a statement, a statement of assurance that God is then going to answer that prayer. And a close look at Numbers, chapter 6, something written by Moses, appears very similar. Notice how similar number 6 seems. The Lord speaks to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Notice, right, that in the book of Numbers, it is the Lord, the word Lord, blessing the people. And the Hebrew there would be Yahweh, right, which is the ESV. You and I are using the ESV right now. And a lot of other English translations, we take the word Yahweh and we write it in English as Lord in all uppercase letters to denote the name of God, right? And we understand this is the covenant God of Israel when we say that. But here in Psalm 67, that word, God, is also used throughout the psalm, but the Hebrew word there is Elohim, which is a different word, which is why they've written God there instead of Lord. And Elohim in the Old Testament is usually a word that emphasizes the university of sovereignty over everything. God is sovereign over all, not just Israel. So why, in Psalm 67, did the writer change the wording of numbers to say Elohim? It's because of how this passage finishes. In verse 7, God shall bless us, let all the ends of the earth fear him. So this idea of praying for God's blessing is not something new for Christians right? We sit down and we ask for God's blessing when we have food. We pray to God to bless our home, bless our families. We ask God to, God to bless us with prosperity. We sometimes ask God to bless us with health. And, and we make our plans and then we ask God to bless our plans, right? I'm, I'm going to go travel. I'm going to go on vacation. Bless us as we travel, right? But we learn very quickly here in the psalm that the purpose of seeking God's blessing is not just for our benefit. It's not just for the benefit of our tribe. And the same thing is true today. The blessing that we receive from God is not just for our own benefit. God blesses his people so that they can in turn be a blessing to others. If you've ever sat down to read your Bible from front to back, you'll get all the way to Genesis 11 You'll get all the way to the Tower of Babel story, and you'll notice that before Genesis 11, everybody spoke the same language. But then humanity determined that they could somehow reach God or become equal with God, and so God punishes them, he disperses them, and he changes all their languages. But in the very next chapter of Genesis, God comes to Abram, and he makes it clear, like, he's, I'm not done, I'm not done with you guys. In fact, I'm gonna develop a new nation and I'm going to bless that nation so that they can be a blessing to others. That those families of this nation will turn, bless other nations and other families, even ones of different languages. Genesis chapter 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Although about a thousand years pass between the time that God reveals his plan to Abraham and the time that Psalm 67 is written, we see clearly that God's plan didn't change. Israel's purpose is still 
to be a blessing to other nations. It's a great plan. Of course it is, because it's God's plan. But over time, Israel loses the sight of it. They forget it. And instead of viewing the blessings of God as something to be passed on to other nations, they become proud, they become inwardly focused, and they believe the messages of God are only for themselves, to keep for themselves. So when we get to Psalm 67, the author changes the words. In fact, they actually change four words, to be exact. They are trying to remind Israel that he had blessed them so that they could bless everyone. If you look at Psalm 67 again, in verses 2 and 6, the emphasis there is on the word earth, a word that refers both to the entire physical world, but also to all the people of the world. In verse 2, then we see the word nations. That's the same word that we usually use to refer to Gentiles, non-Hebrews. In verses 3 and 5, which are identical, we see the word peoples. This is a word that refers to all people, not just Hebrews. And then in verse 4, which is the focus, we see all three words together, nations, people, and earth. But the word for nations here is, the, is actually different than the one we just saw previously in verse 2. This time, it literally means a gathering or a community of people. Because although we tend to think of nations as being places that have borders, it's probably more accurate to view this particular word in terms of people groups or ethnicities. So when all these terms are used together throughout this psalm, the overall picture is very clear, right? God desires to bless his people so that they can in turn bless others. And that is still God's plan for us today. And since it's his plan, we don't get to choose how, right? God laid out a very specific way in which he wants Israel to be a blessing. They were to bless others with the knowledge of God and his saving power. Although at the time Psalm is written, the Jews are still looking for a coming Messiah. They certainly didn't have an understanding of who Jesus would be or how the cross was going to save them from sin. But both Malachi 3 and Hebrews 13 declare that God is always the same and never changes. That his, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always good. He's always loving. He's always all-powerful. No matter how the world changes around us, we can trust that God is the same. God is consistent. So that means that the way that God exactly wanted them to be saved then is the same as today. Faith, right? Faith. We see this clearly when God comes to Abraham and makes a covenant with him to give him a son, to bless him, his descendants. He said, I'm going to make your descendants too numerous to count. And Abram's response was, he believed God. And as a result, God said, he is righteous. Genesis 15 says, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Faith was and has always been the only way to God. But obviously not faith or belief in just anything is acceptable to God. As we see clearly in Hebrews 11, Abraham's faith was in God's promise that one day his descendants would lead to the Savior. So once again, nothing has changed a bit, even since Psalm 67. The way of God, that we need to help people grow and, and uh, have a relationship with, with God is still through the Messiah, still through Jesus. There's obviously lots of ways that we can bless people. Sometimes you can do that by just providing for their physical needs, right? Giving them some food or giving them shelter. And there's obviously nothing wrong with that. In fact, we should be doing that. But we can't just stop there. If we're going to bless people the way that the book of Psalms expects, then we have to meet their spiritual needs as well. The book of Romans says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is a blessing that those who hear it, they believe it, and they choose to place their faith, they choose to give their life to Jesus. But it is not a blessing just to be kept for our own benefit, again, but rather one that we share with all, regardless of their heritage, regardless of where they live, regardless 
of what language they speak. God has entrusted the message of the gospel to get out to all, to bless all. Neither has God's plans for missions changed. Not today, not when it was first written. He still wants us to bless people because we have been blessed. And today that task is given to every single Christian. If you are part of the body of Christ, if you are part of the church, at this time in history, it is our job still to carry out this mission, to carry out this plan. So if that's you, if you identify as a Christian, if you identify as a a person who goes to church, that you're a member of a church, you have a mission by God. Just like we saw from the very beginning, the definition of a a missionary, it, it starts with you. It starts right where you are placed. You are a missionary where? Here, right? You're a missionary here, in in this community, with your neighbors, on your street, in Walden. And then it just goes out a little bit from there. You are a missionary in Montgomery. And then it goes out a little bit from there. You are a missionary in Texas. Goes out from there. You're, You're a missionary in the United States. And it goes out from there. You're a missionary to the world, right? I know that seems huge. I know that seems like a giant huge task. So what's the practical steps? How do you and I just start? Where do we, where do we begin? Well, it begins with worship. Missions begins with worship. You know, as I already pointed out, this psalm was sung, was read, right? And it was focusing the singer's attention to verse 4. But along with all the identical verses, like 3 and 5, which surround it, It's a beautiful picture of all the nations singing and worshiping God. All the nations. That's the heart of missions. Doing all that we can to bring as many as we can to worship God. To have them worship their creator and have him reveal to them who they are and how they fit. You know, one of my very favorite Christian authors is John Piper. He writes, worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in mission, we simply aim to bring the nations into the white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples in the greatness of God. Isn't that a great way of describing our mission as followers of Jesus, to bring others into the white-hot enjoyment of God's glory by getting people to focus on the greatness of God? The obvious implication of that is that we bring others to this place. Well, that means we first have to be here ourselves, right? We are not going to get anyone into church unless we are first in church ourselves. We are not going to get anyone to help or join or volunteer or serve or give in church. Those are all ways we worship unless we are first doing those things ourselves, If we are going to be an effective missionary for Jesus, we must first become a genuine, passionate worshiper ourselves. So the question we have to ask is, in response to John Piper, do I have a white-hot enjoyment of God's glory? (laughs) If I do, then I start there. But if not, I guess the next question is, how do I get there? Right? How do I get there? Missions is accomplished as a team. Notice that all the pronouns in the psalm are plural. The psalmist doesn't pray, God bless me. He says, God bless us. Right? As we've seen consistently throughout the scriptures, God never intends his people to operate in isolation. From creation, he puts his people into communities where he expects them to all work together and to carry out his plans. It wasn't good for Adam to be alone. God created a helper for him, developed a family, that first community. And God said, this community is going to carry out my plans. Next, he chose the Hebrews. He said, this community is going to carry out my plans. And today, that group is the church, right? This church, this body of Christ carries out the mission of God. But it doesn't stop there, right? Even as a local church, our mission can't be carried out by ourselves. Our mission can't be carried out without 
partnering with others. If we're going to be a part of a blessing, and that blessing is going to bless the earth, then we have to work with people who reach out and have the opportunity to be in places where we can't. So we need to view our relationship with all the missions that we support as one where we are partnering with them. We've taken the blessing that's been given to us, and we give our missionaries some of that blessing so that it spills over and is a blessing to others. And as a church, one important way we do that is by financially supporting missions who get the gospel and get things that are needed out to various parts of the world. Right now, we partner with God's Garage, Arrow Child and Family, the Pregnancy Assistance Center North, Hope's Bridge, Compassion United, Living Water International, and Compassion International. And you can learn more about all of those missions and find their contacts at waldenchurch.com. You go to waldenchurch.com, you go to the first tab, you scroll down to missions, it's gonna open up an entire page for you where you can see all our missions, read a little bit about them, and if you click on their picture, it'll take you to their website and you can sign up for their mailing list, right? That's a great way to uh, find out what all of our missions are doing. Sign up for their mailing list, and as they send you the information about what they're doing, then you know how to pray for those missions. That's another way that we can support them, right? Another way, not just financially, is we can support them through prayer. Because again, God answers prayer just like he always has. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think one of the reasons that we have a day like today, you know, a Mission Sunday, where we focus on those missions, is so that we can more effectively partner with our missions. We learn about them and we find out how we can assist them and help them as they seek to be a blessing as well. Let's pray. Father God, you work everywhere and you reconcile and you love and you heal and it's all through your Son, through the power of your Spirit and all through our history, you've invited each and every one of us to join in your work. We ask you to form us more, create in us an image and likeness of your Son through prayer, through the worship of you, through the study of our scriptures. Open our eyes that we may see the world the way you see. Open our eyes that we may see your mission in the world. And then, Lord, spur us to go. Go into our communities, go to the nation, go to the ends of the earth and serve to serve Christ, to give life, to give hope, and to lead all people to your cross and to your Son. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. Thanks for uh, taking this time to see what we're doing here at Walden Church. Of course, we would invite you to come. Come to Walden Church. Be a part of our Sunday morning services. We have two services, one at 9.30. It's our traditional service. We're going to sing hymns out of the hymnal. We're going to have a choir. We're going to do responsive readings, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's going to feel exactly like the church services that you remember from when you, used, when you grew up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. And that's where we have a worship band. Come casual, come however you feel most comfortable. Bring your kids, bring your family. We have something for everybody from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.